Hey everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar about canned seafood here on Ruby. My name is Barton Sieber. I'm a chef, author, seafood evangelist, and uh, well, I'm really pleased to be here with you today. For those of you who have joined us on uh, this weekly webinar series, every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, well, you know that we're just trying to showcase all sorts of different uh, things about seafood. Um, well, just how to prepare it, how to think about it, sustainability, you name it. So in this time, uh, especially right now, people are rethinking their diets, rethinking access to food, all sorts of stuff. So well, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here with you. As I said, um, I partnered with Ruby to create the Seafood Literacy uh, Training Program. Uh, and please check that out if you're interested in learning well. A complete and comprehensive uh, course on seafood. Um, also, uh, I've got a couple of books out on the topic, and uh, I'll be sharing a couple of those recipes with you today. And what we're talking about, well, we're talking about canned seafood. Now, there's a number of reasons why I want to get people eating more seafood. Well, first and foremost is for our health. The bottom line is we eat food to sustain ourselves. The purpose of food is so that we may thrive, right? Well, and seafood is one of the very best tools that we have in order to achieve that. And that's because uh, the omega-3 fatty acids in them that are so healthy, so good for our cognition, the development of our kids' brains, uh, good for our skin, great for our heart. Eating seafood twice a week, as is recommended by experts, is so key to public health that a good friend of mine, Darius Mosaparian, the dean of public health at Tufts, says uh, the three S's of public health are don't smoke, wear your seatbelt, and eat seafood. It's that important, folks. So, in the past couple of weeks here, we have been talking about salmon, we talked about whitefish. Uh, next week, we've got a uh, open access uh, uh, sort of office hours with Chef Bart. To just any questions you want from unicorn steaks to buffalo, whatever you want, we'll talk about it. But um, uh, the other reasons why I want to get more people eating more seafood and why we're doing these webinars is, well, the environmental aspects of it as well. And seafood is a highly sustainable protein. You know, there's better produced seafood and worse produced seafood. And I urge you to take a look at the PDF resource that we have available just down the scroll bar that provides a number of uh, different links to organizations that do great work around um, not only promoting seafood uh, s sustainability, but also giving us information so that we can make great choices when we're at the store and at restaurants. So seafood being a well what i consider the most sustainable of the animal proteins uh just because of the efficiency of it you know it takes less fresh water it doesn't take any land really to raise uh the feed conversion ratio how much food goes into fish as opposed to how much comes out greenhouse gas emissions uh, you name it across the board seafood well it looks pretty it looks really great actually it stacks up well against the other proteins that we have in the center of our plate uh so that center of the plate aspect, though, well, that's one of the things we were talking about today, because in this time when we're cooking out of our pantry a lot, well, we've got canned seafood. And we don't often think about canned seafood necessarily at the center of the plate. And a lot of us are kind of scratching our heads, looking at the pantry, wondering what we're going to do with the products that we are so fortunate to have. And, uh, well, that's why we thought we'd talk about canned today. So... Uh, I've got a number of recipes that I'm going to cook. I've got a lot of different products. It's a really diverse category here. But uh, I'd love to start off with hey, just a little bit of the history of canned seafood because, well, I, I think it's quite fascinating. Uh, but it also gives window to the fact that this has been part of cuisine for a very long time. Uh, and so there's a lot to go back to in terms of finding culinary inspiration. So, we're going to take some questions at the end. I'll give a presentation here, and I'll cook you through a couple of dishes, and then, uh, yeah, let's chat. So I'd love to hear from you. What are your favorite canned seafood dishes? Go ahead and throw those up in the uh, in the questions area. And uh, my Ruby colleague, who's in my ear here, Patrick Britton, who is so uh, generous to host us and help us produce these uh, webinars, will be able to tell me that within a little conversation. So into the history of canned seafood. So canned food in general uh, first came about under in during the Napoleonic Wars in France when Napoleon uh, put out a put out a reward for anybody that could develop a technology that would help feed their advancing armies because well 
an army fights on its stomach, right? So that was becoming a big issue and uh, came up with canning process, which allowed for safe transport at room temperature. And this was before refrigeration, so that was a big, big deal. So canned food uh, very quickly uh, gained prominence in cuisine and, and sort of the daily diets of people everywhere. And the first products that were really canned uh, really was sardines. You know, sardines are very plentiful in Europe and well, the water's all over the, the world. And well, today we still can a lot of sardines, but uh, we'll get into that category itself. But then the technology, well, it jumped the pond. It came over here to the United States. And I'm proud to say where I sit in my home in Maine with my lovely wife, by the way, uh, womaning the camera. Uh, so we uh, appreciate her help today. So my wife and I here on the coast of Maine live literally about 30, 40 yards away from the site where there were once two canneries right here uh, in the state of Maine, where canning really began in this country. Uh, there was at one point there was over 180 canneries here operating and it was a huge part of our coastal economy and we were feeding all of america with the bounty of the gulf of maine now that uh industry ended up jumping across the country and really being centered over in california and then migrating up to alaska and a big part of that movement was well it was the gold rush all of a sudden there were a lot of people over there in remote areas uh, coming in needed to be fed and well we were beginning to populate uh, as Americans the areas, the incredible salmon reserves that we have that flow in incredible numbers into the rivers of the West. So in California, it started and then very quickly moved its way up to Alaska, which is now really the epicenter of canning in America in terms of volume, where they do an incredible job of canning salmon. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then the next chapter in the can, uh, the history of canning is the next story in the history of canning is that of sardines. You know, Cannery Row, Monterey Bay, California, uh, boom town in terms of all of a sudden there was, there was a sleepy little Chinese community, uh, very small, uh, very rural, very quiet. Uh, and then all of a sudden it boomed with industry. And you know, the stories in the, the lore of Cannery Row uh, is quite deep in our history. I mean, one of the great novels around the American experience, the Cannery Rows, written with that as a backdrop. So, but the, uh, well, I was gonna say, the, the canned food supply was so important in America. Now, now imagine yourself in an America prior to the highway system, prior to national air travel. Uh, well, food needed to get from place to place and canned was a great way to do it. And then enter the world wars. And well, all of a sudden we have this national uh, sort of mandate around food. And, well, canned salmon and canned sardines stepped up. It was a huge part of the war effort. In fact, uh, while doing research for one of my books, I found a quote in a government pamphlet that said, the, the sardine can or the can of salmon did as much to win the war as their larger brethren did. And their larger brethren there being referred to as the submarines. So uh, it was a very important part of our effort. So oddly enough, canned seafood has sort of many chapters of history involved with international conflict. But, um, well, yeah, food is also love and feeding people is an act of generosity. So let's focus on that. So the canning industry moved down to Monterey. Uh, and uh, funny enough, it, it, canned seafood kind of became a generational preference as the interstate highway systems were developed, as the cold chain evolved and got way more um, expansive and, and progressive. And then as air travel, and air cargo got cheaper and more abundant, well, we began to have access to more fresh food. And well, that became the aspirational foods. And I think we lost track a little bit of, well, the place of canned seafood, especially in our cuisine. But there's a great resurgence of this, despite the fact that almost all of the canneries on the East Coast have closed. Uh, there are still some people who are doing really, really incredible high quality stuff. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So coming down out of uh, the sardines. So sardines were, as I said, a, a very important, um, you know, industry, but then that industry collapsed. Uh, and as I, I was saying, the, the history of the highway system, we kind of just moved away from this. But uh, 
now that we're beginning to think about, well, really reflecting on the food we have and how we feed each other in these times, uh, also as we've grown more and more cognizant and aware uh, of environmental sustainability, we begin to look at canned seafood really as a win all the way around. So starting on sustainability, uh, yeah, the product that's in the can can be very sustainable. You know, you can find an MSC label on it. A lot of the products that are canned are just, uh, they tend to be the species that are more sustainable. Like you have Alaskan salmon, an exemplary, you know, global example of sustainable fisheries management. You've got uh, MSC certified clams and anchovies and, and a lot of these really great products that you can feel confident about eating. But then it comes in a recyclable can, right? So that's a benefit. And then the other benefit is that despite the fact that this canned salmon came from way up in the northern stretches of Alaska, well, it was canned right there and then sent via ship and then via train and then you know, via truck to get to me. Uh, and it, you know, the carbon footprint of that is, is exceedingly lower than, say, a piece of fish that's flown on a plane to get to you. And it's lower even than uh, you know, most of the animal proteins that we eat, beef, uh, pork, chicken, and lamb. So that you can feel good about. And then there's the issue of food waste. You know, in America, the average American family wastes about, throws away about $1,500 of food a year. Globally, food waste accounts for trillions of pounds of waste. Uh, and it's an inordinate problem with kind of easy solutions. Well, and canned seafood is a really great one of those because it's a convenience food. It sits on your shelf for years, even, and maintaining its quality, ready for you whenever you're ready for it. And... Uh, Right? That lack of waste, that precise uh, portioning that helps us save money and it helps us be environmentally sustainable. So that's a win all the way around. And the fact that uh, environmentally sustainable food, you know what? Most gas stations I've ever been into in America, you can find a can of Alaska pink salmon. Cool. You know, right next to the Snickers bar and the Red Bull, go get yourself a, a can of incredibly healthy, sustainable, awesome product. Um, so with that, uh, I want to also mention that I want to thank, uh, some folks that have come in, in sponsorship today to help us, uh, put this on first is, uh, the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. And, uh, they were generous to supply a number of different cans of awesome quality product here, uh, as well as some friends at Bar Harbor Foods, uh, here in Maine that are doing some really great work, uh, around, well, We'll see a lot of their products. I've got two little boxes of them that are really cool. I'm going to unbox and see what's in there. But uh, so let's talk about some of the species. Let's start with salmon. So way, way, way up in the far reaches of Alaska, Bristol Bay uh, are the greatest runs of salmon that the world has. Uh, the United States has a strategic oil reserve. Well, Alaska is our strategic salmon reserve. It's just, well... It, it is just the epicenter of uh, wonderful, sustainable, delicious, healthy foods for us. So there are two species of the five species that are caught in Alaska of salmon that are canned. And that's red salmon, also known as sockeye salmon, and pink salmon. Uh, and they have different qualities to them. Pink salmon is the smallest of all the species. And it's also the leanest. That said, a lean salmon is still a fatty fish. And it is still loaded with all the omega-3s. Now, uh, sockeye salmon has a little bit more of a gamey flavor to it. And by gamey, I mean, well, it's vibrant. I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit bolder. It has a better presence. Well, not better. It has a great presence on the plates, on the palate, uh, allowing it to pair with some pretty strong ingredients like rosemary and red wine. It's really some, some fun things. So up in Bristol Bay, uh, these canneries, I've got a, a couple of videos, about a minute worth of videos that I'd love to show you. Uh, and I love watching these just because it's mesmerizing of the, the cans coming by. But what's, what's, why I wanted to show this to you is that because these cans are, are hand-packed. Uh, this still is a, an artisan product. Um, and you know, that quality passes all the way down to you on the shelf. So, Patrick, if you wouldn't mind rolling these wonderful mesmerizing videos for us. Appreciate it.
she's here. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Well, I really, that uh, always reminds me of us at the beginning of the uh, the credits for Laverne and Shirley, if you remember that. Anyway, I love that. Um, so canned salmon. There's an incredible number of things you can do with it, and you know I think we often get in just the mindset of canned tuna. And we're not really going to talk about tuna today because there's so much more to talk about. Uh, yeah, you can just do a straight swap of canned salmon for canned tuna in any recipe, and you're going to win. It's absolutely delicious. It's enough of an analog in flavor, though, with its own full personality that, well, your favorite dish that you do with uh, with tuna is going to work. And in fact, I've got a... Uh, uh, a noodle casserole in the oven that I might even sprinkle some some uh, salmon over top at the end here. But um, canned salmon comes packed in water. And oil pack or water pack when it comes to canned seafood across the board, well, it, it's a choice that you have. And there's, I, I have a couple of different opinions on it. First is, well, the oil in the pack, well, I, I always use that oil. It'd be silly to waste it, right? Um, and it's delicious. It tastes like the food's got healthy fats in it. Great. So I open the can of tuna or anchovies, sardines, whatever it is, and I pour that oil and I make a quick vinaigrette out of it. And even if it's not part of that dish, I'll use it later in the meal on a salad or something like that. So that oil becomes a valuable secondary ingredient. The water that seafood is packed in is not uh, applicable in the same way. So you don't really necessarily add it to a, a dish all the time. Uh, but it is great as a flavoring for parts of your dish. And, you know, if you're making a, a pink salmon salad sandwich, well, that water isn't going to do very well in your bread. However, if you're doing a couple of pastas, as I'm going to be doing here today, well, that water, that water is going to make your pasta taste so good. So pour that into the pot along well with your boiling water before you boil the pasta, and you're just making your dish even better. Uh, the other things you can do, I, I uh, cook vegetables in it. I mean, literally, if I open a can, the next thing I boil on the stove, I'm putting that water into it. Um, so that's oil versus water. Uh, you know, and it's also fun to think about canned seafood, not just in terms of how do you make a patty out of it or a pasta, but also really elegant dishes. One of the things I made recently, I, uh, I broiled up some broccoli rob that I had uh, just boiled very quickly blanched in, in salt water with some pink salmon water in there uh, and then broiled it with chili flake a couple of very thinly sliced red onions and as it came out of the broiler i put flaked salmon over top of it and then uh, drizzled it with olive oil oh my god it was so good the sweetness the richness of the salmon the sweetness of the onions pairing with that bitter charred sort of moody presence of the broccoli rub it was a really really delicious dish so there's a lot of creativity you can do. So it's not so much, oh my gosh, what can you do with canned seafood? So much as whatever you're doing, why don't you think, hey, can I put some canned seafood in that? Well, the answer is often yes. So those are the Alaskan uh, canned salmon products that are, are so delicious. Uh, a couple of the other species I want to talk about. Uh, well, the other big sardines. So I've got, uh, let's see, my friends up at Bar Harbor Seafood, uh, thankfully, very generously, they sent me a lot of delicious product. I live well, thank you. I, I am very blessed and fortunate. So sardines, the first canned seafood. Uh, well, now they come in many, many different forms. There's 17 different species of fish that are canned under the name sardines, ranging from um, herring to various sardines, uh, truly to capelin, other things. But they come in all sorts of forms, uh, skinless, boneless, fillets, bristling sardines, two-layer packs, which I really like, those little small bites to them. They come smoked, they come unsmoked, water, they come oil, uh, with jalapenos, with mustard, with tomato sauce, I mean, you name it. Like, if there's a flavor that you dig, you can find it in a can. Um, this Bar Harbor brand, uh, again, a brand that I've always really liked, uh, but they're also neighbors of ours here in Maine, so... They got to be proud of our neighbors, right? Uh, but that's the logo that I was saying about earlier, that little blue check, that's an MSC mark. That's one of the great ways that you can uh, use to, to be sure you're getting a sustainable seafood product in the can. But these are so easy to use, uh, no matter what your uh, 
you know, which one you prefer, which flavor profile or size of fish. Uh, I like oil pack smoked in water, or I'm sorry, smoked uh, in oil. And the dishes that I make with those, uh, you need a mac and cheese with some toasted breadcrumbs on top made from the oil that the sardines were packed in, you know, crunchy on top. And then I flake a couple of sardines over the top of it. Man, that's delicious. My cat and, uh, well, here comes my cat <laughs> because canned seafood. This is my cat mini biscuit. So welcome to the show, babe. Yeah. Hey, Lady Life, could you please? Thanks. See you, cat. Um, one of the, uh, another thing I really like to do is uh, in the summertime, we grow a whole lot of tomatoes and these big, thick slices of heirloom tomatoes, juicy and ripe and aromatic, acidic and wonderful. Uh, put some greens and herbs over top of that, something spicy like uh, arugula or mustard, uh, some herbs in there, cilantro, fresh parsley, just leaves picked. Make a vinaigrette out of the oil and then flake the sardines right over top. I mean, it's absolutely, absolutely delicious. Um, and I must say also that sardines are one of my son. We have a three and a half year old uh, kid squid, I call him. Uh, can of sardines, one of his absolute favorite foods. And I'm sorry, but I am going to do this to you. But my son calls them baby sharks. Do, 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 baby sharks. Do, 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 do. So you're welcome. Now you're stuck with that. But um, hey, I mean, if you're going to get a kid to eat sardines and grow his brain, and well, it's a really convenient meal. And we sit down next to him, and I put hot sauce on mine, eat it straight out of a can. And uh, well, life is good. So other species that are canned in a similar fashion to uh, sardines, uh, well, you're going to find mackerel, which is, again, one of the original species that was canned and very popular. Uh, a while back, less popular now. It is a strongly flavored or robustly flavored seafood, but that doesn't mean it's bad flavored. It just means that, well, you have to use it as a strongly flavored ingredient. The same way you don't put rosemary in your dish, hoping that it doesn't taste like much. No, it, it's got to have presence and personality. Let it shine. But appreciate it for that. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a wonderful ingredient. Uh, the smoke flavor uh, gives it so much umami. It adds so much presence to a dish. Uh, and those eat exactly the same way as, well, sardines do. You know, just the beautiful flesh, um, the skin. Some of them have bones. And to that point, so skin, skin or bone, bottom line is when they're canned, those bones and skin reduce to nothing in terms of texture. Uh and, well, you're, you're not wasting any food during the processing of it. And, uh, well, you get all the nutrition benefits out of them, too. That thin layer of fat right underneath the skin holds a lot of the omega-3s. So you're getting a lot more of that. Also, the bones, when they cook down for so many hours in the can, well, they break down. Their texture is gone, but all of those minerals and vitamins and calcium become bioaccessible, meaning, well, our bodies can absorb them really easily. So, to me, there's no negative impact to the uh, eating experience, but there's an incredibly great, I mean, there's a great impact on the health uh, that we get from them. So trout is also uh, canned like this. Uh, I've seen some other types where salmon is canned in these more sort of sardine style. Shellfish is another big one that's uh, canned. So you've got mussels, uh, clams is a, a really big category, uh, smoked oysters, Absolutely delicious. Just eating hot sauce with a cocktail fork straight out of the can. Uh, my wife and I make salads of a can of chickpeas, a can of canned seafood, whatever it is, but can smoked clams or mussels, some thin shaved carrots, throw it all in a bowl, olive oil, vinegar, lunch. There you go. It's absolutely fabulous. Now, one of my very favorite of all the canned seafoods, though, is the anchovy. It is my love. It is my, probably my most preferred uh, of all seafoods anywhere, but um, they are used in a different way than other canned seafoods are. And that is that they are typically used as, well, they're integrated into the beginning of a dish. So if you're making pasta sauce, hey, I mean, even if you're opening up a can of ragu, start a pan with a little bit of olive oil, all the oil from some anchovies and the anchovies right into the pan, let them just melt. They disintegrate into nothing. Zero texture, but all of that flavor, that umami richness, uh, that slightly fermented flavor, 
it will make everything you eat better. I saute them. I start zucchini like that. I start, you know, I glaze butternut squash that's been roasted in the oven like that. There's so many ways to incorporate that flavor and those healthful attributes. My very favorite uh, are smoked anchovies, and this is a really elegant product um, that I serve as is. You know, I'll put them, and I'll just lay them out on a plate, put some more olive oil over them, a little bit of mace, uh, and some fresh chopped mint, uh, and just eat it like that on crackers or buttered bread. Oh my gosh, it's so good. That was a, a dish that I ate a lot in uh, when I was living in Morocco, and I just Fell in love with it and we eat it around the house here several times a week. So I'm going to get into some recipes here. I'm going to clear up. But while I'm doing so, I want to talk about another category of canned seafood. And that is, well, prepared uh, dishes. So let's see. There's so many kinds of canned seafood. I can't, can't even organize them all. Um, so uh, again, these are from my friends up at Bar Harbor Foods, uh, and I haven't even broken through all these boxes yet, but when you think about canned seafood, don't think just about the seafood, think about what you can do with it. Clam and corn chowder, lobster bisque, uh, I mean, geez, what else do we have? Five different kinds of clam chowder, Manhattan, New England, uh, let's see, lobster chowder, seafood stock, fish chowder, fish stock, clam juice, lobster juice, I mean, hey, if, if the creative cook in you isn't going ding, 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 talk about an incredible category of ingredients that is just inspiring. I mean, there's so much you can do with it, and that's cool. And oftentimes we don't get inspired by the, the middle aisles in the grocery store. But this one sure is, I think, one of the very best pantries that we have in terms of great ingredients. So to my lovely wife, I'm going to ask if you could start moving the camera and come on over here, and we're going to start cooking a few things. So I'm going to start answering some questions as well uh, from Angela. Uh, hey, Barton. I think you were with us last week. I appreciate you joining. Thank you so much for these informative live events. What's your opinion about the toxicity of the aluminum tins in which food is stored? The level of toxins in fish is like 2 and 0 and often come in aluminum tins. You know what? I'm actually going to answer that question a little bit later. I absolutely will get to it. It's very important. But the bottom line is eat seafood. It's very good for your health. That's it. But I will I will get to the toxicity question in just a little bit. And then I'll take a Carol, uh, question from Carol. I made one of the halibut dishes from last week, event. It was delicious. What's the best way to reheat leftover fish? Ah, good question. And actually kind of relevant to uh, what we're doing here today. So I'm just going to drop some pasta to get some things going. And did you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Professional chef. Yes, we do eat this at home. Yes, because we are humans. Yeah. That stuff is delicious and we have a three-year-old. So I'm gonna show you how to do uh, a mac and cheese with peas and uh, Alaskan, uh, canned Alaskan salmon. I'm also gonna do a, a really interesting dish based on an Italian tonnato. Uh, just to explain what I'm doing right here. And yes, I do use my fingers to stir boiling water. But uh, so the best way, Carol, to heat, reheat leftover fish is well, I like to integrate it into another dish in, in that way, but integrate, I mean, uh, you know, flake some poached halibut over top some sliced tomatoes, and in that way you're not reheating it. But if you're making a mac and cheese with some salmon, Alaskan salmon from last night, cook the mac and cheese, get it hot, and then leave it on the stove in the pot where it cooked so it has that continuation heat, and then flake it in in small pieces, you know, in, in batches, so that the food that it's served with is really the reheat agent. It really works well for a risotto, right? A nice dish with a lot of heat that can penetrate into the fish. And that is true for canned seafood as well. So in that same way, it reheats it, uh, but also helps to sort of carry that flavor through the dish. My pasta's below. All right, so I got those going. I'll take one more question. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kate, do you have any different uses for either oil or water packed seafood? What do you recommend using canned sardines? Do they need to be rinsed? So I, I spoke about that a little bit. So I, I like oil packed just because I like the oil to be used in vinaigrettes or whatever, sauces, emulsions, uh, you know, that oil for mix it into a Caesar salad, whatever. It's absolutely delicious. Uh, the water pack has its uses. So both of these pasta waters had some of the pink salmon the liquid that came out of that 
directly in the pasta water, so it absorbs those flavors. It really depends on the dish uh, that you're going to be making with it, but I recommend you have multiple kinds of uh, canned seafood of all different species, water pack, oil pack on your uh, your shelf at all times. And whether it's vegetable oil or olive oil, it doesn't so much make a difference because the flavor really is that of the seafood. So I've got some uh, macaroni straight out of a box that I'm cooking up here. I put some peas in that. Uh, it's cooking in the salmon water with other water ad additional. So I'll finish that out and then flake the salmon into it. Very uncomplicated, but very easy. And it takes your Tuesday night, oh my God, what am I going to feed the kids in that moment and turns it into, hey, as a parent, I just really succeeded. Yep. Got my kid eating vegetables, salmon. Hey, there you go. And all, all you had to do is walk over to your pantry. So I'm going to make some salmon cakes now. And a salmon cake is a, well, I was a pretty simple uh, recipe, but it's also incredibly di diverse in terms of what you can then do with the mix. So this is pink salmon, and if you can come in here close, can. So you'll see that you have little pieces of skin, uh, and you'll find bones, pieces of the backbone or, or pin bones. And watch this. Okay, it's gone. Sure looks like a piece of salmon now, and it has the exact same texture. So what I'll mix into my salmon cake uh, is, I actually did this wrong because I'm busy talking to you. So the whole point of this demo that I was doing, I just messed up. Hi, cat. You're back, huh? I'm not going to keep her away. She's a member of the family, so I'm okay with that. So what I like to do is whenever you're making a, a tuna salad, a salmon salad, anything salad, I like to mix the other ingredients first. Uh, because I want to maintain the texture, the flake of that fish as best I can. So I don't want to be trying to mix breadcrumbs for a salmon cake to get them integrated while I'm mashing the fish. So I'm going to mix the breadcrumbs, lemon juice, mayonnaise all together into a, into a paste and then gently flake in the fish. And in that way, it also allows for your breadcrumbs to absorb uh, some of the oil from the fish as well as to more effectively bind the entire thing. Now the amount of breading or binder, whether that binder be pureed chickpeas, pureed uh, kidney beans, um, you name it, whatever it is, uh, it can be to whatever extent you want it to be. I like as little binding as possible, just enough to keep it together in a form that you can say, oh yeah, that's a salmon cake, not salmon hash, right? So I mix that and then I just I let it sit for a little while. Let those panko breadcrumbs that I was using, you can use any breadcrumbs, let them absorb the mayonnaise, absorb the lemon juice, become a soft, uh, in French cuisine, it's what's called a panade. So it's basically this bread binder. So I'm gonna leave that there for a few minutes. Uh, and the salmon, uh, for a salmon melt, well, it's the exact same thing, just minus the breadcrumbs, put it on top of a piece of, when I do make salmon melts or tuna melts, I toast the bread first to give it a little bit of resilience. Uh, so that the toasted bread then absorbs uh, any moisture from the topping. Uh, and it just gives you a, a better textural contrast and crust there. So I'm going to let that sit, and I'm going to come back over to my dishes here. And while I do the really menial task of checking the pasta to see if it's done, um, it is. I'm going to take another question and answer that. So, Barton, let's talk anchovies. Hey, Bill G., I like you. If you like anchovies, we're friends, buddy. I love them. Do you? Yes, yes, I do. Tell us your secrets, how to shop for them, what to look for, and your favorite ways of using them. Uh, there, there's very little I don't put anchovies in. Uh, I was talking about that tomato sauce. You know, start it off or throw a can of uh, San Marzano tomatoes in there if you want to make your own sauce or just a can of, you know, jar of bottled pasta. Uh, a bottle of uh, spaghetti sauce is great. Uh, I make a zucchini carpaccio with them that I really like. You know, in summer, there's, there's a, a joke up here in Maine that says the only time you lock your car in Maine is during zucchini season. And I am absolutely guilty of when we drop our kid off at daycare of kind of scoping out which other parents' cars are unlocked and just like dumping <laughs> our excess of zucchini in there. So we're constantly finding ways to use it. And so I I shave it pretty thin, just mounds of it, 
Uh, and then I make a, a dressing of torn anchovies, the anchovy uh, oil, vinegar, sherry vinegar I like to use, and then mint leaves in there. Just as a salad, you eat it fresh before the zucchini wilts. So good, so fresh, and actually effective at using up all your zucchini, plus very nutritious. So, thanks, Bill. So, let me just drain some pasta here. all at once here. So I know I'm trying to do a lot of dishes all at once in this little uh, webinar we've got, but that's the beauty of canned salmon. They're so diverse. There's so much to do with it that I, I did want to show you a number of options. Um, tonato sauce, moving into a separate recipe here. Tonato sauce is a, I believe it's a northern Italian dish of pureed canned tuna with olive oil and olives uh, and lemon juice. And I've gone ahead and made a version of that. And I shared a recipe with you uh, in that PDF, those resources. Uh, I shared a recipe with you for mackerel tonato. But what I've made here is uh, a salmon tonato. So this is seven ounces or so of uh, canned red salmon. So that's the sockeye salmon. And I put it in my, in my trusty high-speed blender with uh, a little bit of water, uh, some lemon juice, and uh, a handful of olives, uh, green olives or black olives, pitted, of course, and puree that into, well, a very thin, fine puree. And then I whip in a lot of olive oil. And what you end up with here is an incredibly just unctuous, beautiful, richly silken textured sauce that is so, so flavorful. No matter what you're using, it, it, uh, you know, whether it's salmon or tuna, sardines, mackerel, um, it's all delicious. I, I, the salmon, if you're going to do this recipe, salmon is probably the, uh, the lightest in flavor of those. It's going to please everyone really and the, the punctuation of the olives that brininess and the, the bite of the lemon it's beautiful what's really fun about this sauce is that well I, it's served cold typically spooned over meat so if you're grilling up a pork chop man, a spoonful of that over top oh my god it's typically served with veal also just to add some flavor and that's that umami flavor uh, that really just draws out the best in anything it's paired with. So there is an egg yolk in here as well. It's a raw egg yolk. You can use a cooked one um, if you're worried about serving the raw egg yolk, which in my family we don't, but uh, uh, it's basically like a Caesar dressing with the ratios changed up a little bit. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here is because the egg yolk is raw, uh, we'll let the pasta cool down a little bit. So this isn't just something you, you spoon over cold dishes, although the variety that you can do that with is near infinite. That uh, Bill, that um, I was just talking about the, the anchovies. If you like anchovies, you'll love this sauce. Check out this recipe. Uh, spoon this over uh, roasted root vegetables straight out of the oven and let it bloom their flavor. Uh, zucchini, carpaccio, thin shaved raw carrots tossed in this. It's an amazing vinaigrette, an amazing sauce, an amazing pasta sauce. And so with this, I'm just going to pour just a little bit over it and uh, allow the heat of the pasta to bind that sauce to it and it will absorb. And it just becomes this incredibly rich, um, admittedly the color is a little bit lacking. Uh, and by lacking, I mean, well, it's not off-putting. It's just there isn't much color to it. So throw in some chopped herbs in there. Throw in some tar chopped tarragon or parsley, whatever you want, just to liven it up. And it is a surprising, unique, fun, innovative way to use canned seafood. So there's tonato sauce. Tonato in Italian for tuna, tono. But uh, you can call it whatever you want. Salmo sauce. How's that? I'll call this salmo sauce. Next dish I'm doing. Ah. Well, this is another classic, another pasta. Just, you know, I've been running a lot to reduce the stress of the circumstances and on the Peloton. So I think my body's just really craving carbs right now, I'm guessing, just by looking at my stove. Um, but anyway, 
one of the things I wanted to show is how versatile canned uh, soups are, you know, whether it's clam, broth, juice, nectar. Um, so I was thinking about a tuna noodle casserole. And instead of putting the cream of mushroom soup in there, I want to put some lobster bisque in there, right? Let's go for this, right? We're, we're in Maine. We're in life. I mean, it's easy. It was on the, on the shelf. And then I was thinking like, hey, you know what? I'm going to make enough to feed my neighbor too because, well, in these unprecedented times, the very best thing we can do is love each other, feed each other, look out for each other. So I figured, well, I'd make a little more. So I threw in some lobster and corn chowder, delicious big chunks of lobster that end up in there, boiled rotini, uh, two cans of soup, a little bit of extra milk. And then I threw in some broccoli, uh, raw broccoli, and some panko on top just to give it a little texture. And, uh, well, put in a nice big cast iron skillet like this. And gosh, that's delicious. Doesn't that smell good? Yes, it does. Yes. See, we actually have smell o vision because uh, my wife behind the camera can, can answer. It, so it's great. So that's a, a fun way to do it, whether it's clam chowder, whether it's Manhattan clam chowder, whatever it is. Uh, any canned seafood soup or canned broth or even fish stock would work in this. So with that, I think I'm done. I don't think I need to show you how to flake salmon over, uh, over kids pasta, but it is delicious. So with that, I'm going to say uh, again, thanks to uh, Alaska Seafood Market Institute as well as Bar Harbor Foods for providing generously some delicious things for us to eat today. I hope you've enjoyed seeing these dishes and just thinking about seafood or canned seafood from a culinary uh, sort of innovation standpoint. And uh, well, hey, so with that, I'd love to get back to some questions. So I'm going to walk over here and be, actually one thing before I do that, which is uh, canned seafood is in the news. You know, and we're thinking about it more because, well, we're stockpiling and uh, those of us who are so fortunate to be able to afford to do so. Uh, you know, thinking about cooking out of the pantry. But uh, you know what? It, this is not the first time that we've looked to cans for uh, something we need in crisis times. And uh, my wife and I were on a trip a while back, and we found this. And, uh, yeah, we've been canning the basics for a long time. This is uh, for your fallout shelter. I guess it's still good. But, hey. So with that, how about we take some questions? Which canned seafood, from Gerard, which canned seafood needs uh, additional work, like removing the bones, etc.? You know, Gerard, uh, that's easy. If Eat them. <laughs> There's no additional work. You don't even have to chew any harder. It just disappears into the dish. And as I was saying earlier, you get all those healthful benefits from it as well, plus the environmental benefits that you're using, well, more of the animal. So with that, I'd say if you have a can of seafood that has bones and skin in it, eat them. If you don't like that, well, look for a can that doesn't have them. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not worth doing the work yourself, I think, because it is available to you. But uh, also, I would just encourage you to eat the bones and skin. Thanks, Jerry. All right, next question is coming from Ruth Han W. What a nice name. How do you can tuna casserole and other tuna recipes? Uh, so I've talked about that to, to some extent already. Uh, we didn't really focus on, on tuna too much today. Um, I do want to get back, Ingela, to your question about uh, toxicity. But um, there's two ways that I do tuna. There's two ways that I think about it in a dish. Do I want texture or do I want it fully integrated uh, as part of a dish, like that tonado sauce? Uh, how I do it... it in terms of, I think how I'm responding to your question is that, well, if I'm doing a tuna noodle casserole, you know what, put the oil or the water from the tuna, in that case I might use water back tuna, into the casserole itself. And then just in the last couple of minutes, flake some tuna, big chunks of tuna on top so that you get all that rich texture. You get some of that caramelization from the broiler or the roasting um, so that the tuna is really present, you know, salmon the same. Uh, or you could go another way, which is to be more integrated. And you take your can of cream of mushroom soup or your can of lobster bisque and you match, you literally pound some tuna into that to kind of thicken that. Uh, but that carries the flavor throughout the dish, takes away some of that texture. And one of the other dishes that I, or the recipes that I shared with you is for a, 
an appetizer, a pounded tuna. We don't often think about tuna as a as a you know an hors d'oeuvre ingredient, but uh, a can of tuna pounded with a mortar and pestle until it's a very smooth paste, and then whipped with olive oil till it's this voluminous, rich, wonderful, aromatic. You throw in herbs and some spices, maybe just a hint of ground coriander or toasted ground fennel seed in there. And woo, I mean, it's an incredible thing. You put it on little rye toasts, you're going to blow your guests away with this really elegant, awesome dish. Uh, and you can make that with well, any seafood that comes in a can, including all the ones that I'm looking at here today. So thanks, Ruth Ann. All right, Christine, what is the best way to bake defrosted salmon fillets in large quantities for catering? Wow. Well, best way to do that is I would not defrost the fillets, quite honestly. Uh, depends on, well, depends on the dish that you're doing. If you're uh, you know, serving the salmon entree, the typical American fashion sort of center of the plate, uh, I would put the fillets straight from the freezer, which, by the way, yields absolute fabulous quality uh, fish these days, uh, put it in straight from the freezer or let it thaw out on the countertop on the tray for just two or three minutes, just enough for that surface ice to, to yield a little bit so that when you season it, the salmon is absorbing that salt and it's able to penetrate a little bit. So, uh, but other than that, throw it in a low, slow oven, 250 degrees on some frozen salmon. You know what? It's going to take a long time to cook. I mean, it's going to take maybe an hour to cook from frozen at that point. But then right when you're ready for service and, oh, man, the, the, you know, the weight captain is calling for the plates. Let's go. Let's go. Brian is demanding our food and the catering. Ah! Okay. You turn the heat up to 500. You give it one minute. And it is perfectly cooked, ready for you to plate. Uh, and it has that added, that last minute jolt of heat uh, to really get it to, to that serving temp. So, that's my answer. So uh, let, let's get to Angela's question about toxicity. Uh, so th there's been a lot of talk about methylmercury, uh, and, uh, which is in some seafoods, as well as toxicity uh, issues relating to cans and some of the chemical liners that we put in cans. So one thing is around the can, I look for steel cans. A, they're recyclable, more so than aluminum, and... Uh, you know, can linings. A lot of cans will now say BPA free lining uh, by phenyl. I can't remember the the chemicals in it, but um, you know, a lot of these linings are now consumer safe, and I think we just weren't paying attention to that at first. But uh, so look for that as much as you're looking for that MSC or BAP label or, or whatever sustainability marker there is for you. Uh, it'll also say a BPA, and I lined can um and it, it'll tell you because that is a sales point now on, on the um, the healthiness of it uh but in terms of the toxicity that can be in seafood itself so these are uh persistent organic chemical or persistent organic pollutants uh that end up in our ecosystems via human activity so coal burning power plants uh push a lot of uh, uh, methylmercury into the air in the form of smoke, which then particulates and falls down into the oceans, at which point it gets up the food chain. And big, big fish like tuna, like some of the bigger tunas, uh, can aggregate that over time to the point where it can become of health concern for some populations, in, uh, human populations. And I say some because bottom line is uh, eating seafood is a very good thing for us. But there are certain populations, uh, very young children and pregnant nursing mothers, who should be cognizant and mindful of uh, limits on consumption of a few products. Tuna being uh, one of them, look for uh, canned uh, uh, light tuna is one that is just inherently lower in mercury because the fish that they're canning are a lot smaller. But if that is, uh, I, would, I would suggest you go to the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, they've got a seafood calculator as well as the Environmental Working Group to find more information about tunas and, uh, that are where the spectrum is on mercury. But when it comes to the rest of the population, yes, we should be mindful of it. But bottom line is it's more we should be eating seafood and eating a diversity of seafood. 
And when we diversely, we are not at risk of aggregating too much from one thing. So that would be my uh, statement there. Uh, but the other thing, really the caveat I want to leave you with is don't smoke, wear your seatbelt, eat seafood. If you're really worried about methamurking, canned Alaska salmon. Negligible, decimal dust, if any at all, is in here. Absolutely, incredibly helpful for you. Wonderful. Uh, clams, mussels, oysters, mackerel. These are things we should be eating regularly uh, and deliciously. So thanks for that. Okay. Uh, Brenda, I live and work on the West Coast, Corona de Mar, California. Wonderful place. I have a client who will only eat non-fatty fish. Which good tasting non-fatty fishes dishes do you suggest I prepare? Hmm. I, I'm, I'm curious if they're not, if they want non-fatty fish as a taste preference because they don't like the more fuller, robust flavors of mackerel or bluefish, uh, or if it's a health thing, which uh, let's just go with the taste thing. So what I would do there is uh, I mean, the whitefish family. So anything related to cod, Alaska or Pacific cod, Alaska pollock is, is a really great one. Uh, incredibly versatile on this coast. We've got hay, haddock, pollock, cusk, ling, monk, skate, wolf, dog, gray, eel, pout, place, flounder, witchbacks, blackbacks, dabs, soles. Uh, you're going to find tilapia, catfish, you know, et cetera. I mean, it's all flaky white flesh fish. Kind of, and it all cooks mostly the same. Sure, there are nuances to it, but in terms of a, a, of a dish like baked in spiced tomato sauce served over a brown rice almond pilaf, the type of fish doesn't really matter. So really buy what's freshest and best, what best suits the, the price point. Um, so those are, you know, really it's about buying what's best. But the other thing is I would, I would actually suggest uh, a lot of shellfish are, they do have healthy fats to them, um, but they don't have that flavor. And the other thing is that I might go you know, challenge the palate a little bit. I meet so many people who say to me, I really don't like fishy fish. I don't like my fish to taste like much. I love salmon. You know that salmon tastes like something, right? It tastes like a whole lot of delicious. It has a lot of plate presence, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's not a, a subtle thing. It's a wonderful flavor. Uh, and so when people say that I don't like full flavored fish, uh, you know, oftentimes they'll repeat back to them using their own words that they, that they actually do. Um, and so it's about finding ways to integrate it. If, if it's a fatty piece of salmon, very slow roast it. Uh, what that does, what that prevents is oxidation or, or uh, carcinogenic of the fats. And a lot of that flavor that people don't like is, is when high heat is applied to fat, which burns it. The same way, that's why we like steaks on the grill, really well marbled ribeyes because that fat drips off and burns and creates this flavor. And in fish, that could be absolutely wonderful the same. However, if somebody is averse to that strong flavor, by slow roasting or poaching or steaming, you don't aerate those fats. Uh, so you don't expose them to that high heat uh, and you end up with a more nuanced, subtler flavor. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate you. All right, Lynette Michelle, I loved canned fish. Awesome. But your palate is limited to salmon and mackerel cats, tuna salad and tuna noodle casserole. Um, excited to learn about some different recipes and different types of canned fish. Well, thanks for joining us today. I hope you have delivered on that. All right, next question from Sharon. What are the best flavorings for a salt rub for salmon? Ooh, cool, good question. Uh, Sharon, the first, I, I would throw a question back at you. Uh, which is, well, what do you what do you want the final outcome to be? Do you want a southwestern feel? So you got uh, kosher salt, you got a little bit of brown sugar in there for some sweetness and that molassesy richness. Throw in a little bit of powdered cumin, some onion powder, and some adobo chili flake. <coughs> Excuse me, something like that, or some uh, ground up moreno pepper. Ooh, man, that's good. Uh, it, it really depends on whatever flavoring profile you're looking for. But a really good base recipe is to think about, well, it's a salt and sugar ratio. I really like a little bit of sugar in 
uh, any seasoning, especially when you're doing high heat. It's not enough. I don't put in enough sugar to taste sweet. What I do is I put in just enough sugar so that it caramelizes. It gets sticky and it absorbs that smoke flavor. It uh, it just adds a, a great deal of nuance and balance and, and uh, kind of evens it all out. Again, it's not to taste the sweet. And I'm not a big fan of American barbecue sauces for that reason. It's just overly sweet. But really, as a balancing factor, think about a vinaigrette. You know, you've got as analog. So you've got salt as your oil, which is the majority of it. But vinegar is really kind of a, a little driver bringing it all into focus and balance. Uh, so salt and sugar, and I usually do maybe six parts salt to one part sugar, or brown sugar. Uh, and then as a base for salmon, I think the flavors of fennel and uh, onion powder with salmon are just universally awesome, regardless of really what cuisine or flavor patterns you're going for. So ground up uh, powdered uh, toasted fennel seed is amazing. Uh, just makes it in there to your preference. So. Thanks for your question. Appreciate it. Appreciate you sharing. Oh, another one for you. I bought your book, Joy of Seafood, and it's terrific. Well, thank you for that little plug, Sharon. I appreciate that. That's my uh, most recent book, uh, called Joy of Seafood, just published last year. Uh, it's almost a thousand recipes. So if you are uh, looking looking for something to do with fish, I, I've got a couple of years of ideas for you in there. So thanks for the comment there. Uh, so, so, yeah, well, I appreciate your great comments, Sharon. Thank you. All right, from Sue, uh, what brands of canned seafood do you recommend? Is Vital Choice a good brand? Uh, Vital Choice is fabulous. Uh, uh, some friends of mine run that, run that company, and uh, they've, they've long been a leader doing really high-quality, excellent stuff. Uh, they've really had a focus on, on the healthful aspects of uh, salmon and the fresh salmon from Alaska and the canned salmon up there and salmon oils. Uh, so, yeah, I very much recommend them. Um, but... There's a lot of really great brands uh, coming out. So uh, in terms of sardines, I, you know, it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, go up, go to, the, go to the store and buy every type they have so that you can sort of winnow down. Do I like two layer or one layer? Do I like smoked or not smoked? Uh, do I like water pack or oil pack? Mm, you know, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a canned fish tasting. It's not as sexy as a wine tasting, right? But it is in this house. I mean, I like doing that. So buy a couple of brands, you know, find what you like and uh, stick with that, but explore. One of the things that I, you know, I got, I, I have to be honest, when I buy uh, canned salmon, I, I often, you know, judge the, judge the can by its cover. And uh, canned salmon has a very long history of really artful, wonderful, uh, just beautiful artwork and fun names and, reminiscent of the places they're from so uh, but really I have yet to meet much canned seafood that I don't like so thanks Sue all right from Heather light smoked canned salmon straight out of the jar with pork to mouth there you go so you're talking about your favorite way to eat it I love that in fact uh, yeah a, a bottle of tapatio hot sauce and uh, just a can of good salmon or a can of tuna or a can of sardines there it is lunch is lunch is served all right, uh, let's see, from, again from Brenda. When my kids were little, I snuck a can of tuna in my chunky tomato sauce. Yeah. And uh, although they said they didn't like tuna, they never noticed and gobbled it up over pasta. Yeah, there you go, right? Throw in a couple of tins of anchovies and tuna. Uh, it's back to my belief that people who don't like seafood uh, actually probably do. Um, and... One way that I talk about seafood is, is people who are uncomfortable with it. I, I use the turn of phrase, sell the dish, not the fish. It, kids might not sit down to a dish of tuna pasta, but it's a, a bowl of linguine topped with a beautiful Italian red sauce. Cool. That's it. Well, Italian red sauce aptly describes tomatoes cooked with tuna too, right? So, But I do think it's important to tell them because I do think it's important. Uh, and, and after the fact can be fine. But bottom line is we do need to promote, encourage, and cultivate a very positive outlook, um, sort of cultural acceptance of seafood, and uh, to eat more of it. So thanks, Ben. All right, from Tom. Do you like the Wild Planet brand tuna? We're looking for great recipes, surf food shows, and training sessions other than just tuna salad and casserole. Yeah, the Wild, Wild Planet brand are, are, are really great. Um, you know, they came, came on the scene uh, a while back and... Uh, yeah, I, I remember 
the debut of those products and tasting a whole lot of them and, and thought they were very great. Uh, just a brand that pays a lot of attention to not only the product in the can, but to their health messaging and packaging. And I, I think are really responsible about how they talk about seafood in really positive ways for the entire industry. So yeah, I'm very, very much uh, in favor of that. And, you know, uh, I would say if you're, if you're looking for a fun, innovative and surprising way to serve it at a food show, uh, that, that uh, tonato sauce. Uh, so I served, I shared that it's a spaghetti with mackerel sauce is the name of the recipe that I shared in that PDF. Uh, but olives, lemon juice, egg yolk, olive oil, and a can of tuna pureed together until a smooth paste. Whew, man, that's amazing. And people will be a little surprised by it. So cool. All right. Well, I know that we are coming up on the end of time. We just have a few more questions here. So uh, another one from uh, Brenda. Hey, uh, you like sardines, Brenda? I like you, Brenda. You're, you're all over the place with your seafood. I dig. Um, with lemon juice, parsley, fine chopped celery, whatever, alliums, if you like, onions, yeah, mustard. Ooh, man, Brenda, that sounds really good. And, and similar sort of in construct to that pounded tuna appetizer I was talking about. You put a little more flavors in there. and uh, Quite honestly, yours is probably better. Cool. I'm going to use that. Thanks, Brenda. All right, Lauren, grew up with mac and cheese and tuna. Thank you for the memory. Yeah, awesome. Keep eating it. It's great. And then uh, from uh, Sean, apologize for my ignorance, but how do you flake a fish? Good question. Sure, buddy. All right, let me uh, get this can. Pop drop them so I don't cut myself. So when you have the, Gary, could you? Uh... So these are hand packed uh, fillets. So they've been uh, steamed first before they're put into the can. Uh, and then packed in quite tightly. You know that, that statement, packed like a can of sardines? Well, that statement was because the olive oil that sardines were canned with was more expensive than the sardines, so it made economic sense to shove them all in together, hence the, the phrase in our popular culture. So if you look at this, this looks like, well, a filet of salmon, right? As you would pull out of a poaching dish or a baked, and then uh, when fish is cooked, it easily flakes apart as those muscles, muscle fibers, and you can see them there. And just gentle pressure between your fingers, and there's a flake of fish, and there's a flake of fish, and a flake of fish. And they don't have to be even or exact, but you want them to be generally about the same size. And any parts of whatever fish like this, that's perfectly fine and natural and ends up um, grinding down a little bit and carrying flavor throughout while you get these big flakes that offer this really wonderful textural contrast, visual contrast, and sort of these flavor pops when you, when you eat one. So, all right, y'all. Thank you so much. We're at the end of our questions, but uh, I really appreciate you joining us here today. Remember, uh, wear your seatbelt, don't smoke, eat seafood. Uh, keep feeding each other, too. Feeding people is an act of love. It's an act of generosity, and right now the entire world can use a whole lot of that. We always can. So thank you to all the cooks, the parents, the people that care for each other and their neighbors. My name is Barton Seaver. Thanks for joining me. Please uh, join us every Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, 11, p uh, 11 a.m. Pacific for webinars on various topics. We've got a, a whole new slew of them that we're going to announce soon. Uh, I would appreciate it if you, you checked out some of my books. So if you go to any bookseller or online, um, I've uh, got eight books, uh, all mostly about seafood, uh, encouraging you to eat more. Check out my course that I did with Ruby, seafoodliteracy.com, and, of course, on social media as well. And, uh, hey, I appreciate you. Lots of love. Lots of seafood. Take care. 